does this work? Does this work? Okay. Just wait a second. Okay, it works finally. Uh, no? Oops. Maybe that was okay. No? Okay, well, thanks to the organizers uh, for having me here. And uh, thanks for accommodating this last talk of the day, because I couldn't make it on Monday. Um, and uh, this reminded me of a joke uh, about Indian railways. So in, in India, we have these very, very long trains. Um, and usually, by the time you get to the last compartment, it's exhausting. And one of the feedback that came in the form was, please don't have a last compartment in your train. If you do, please have it in the middle of the train. So, um, uh, well, something like that about these talks. Uh, also, Hugh told me that uh, maybe I should uh, change the title of my talk and see if anyone notices. Uh, and clearly, <laughs> so, so I'm, go I'm going to talk about uh, collective behavior at the end of the day um, in uh, synthetic active matter. Uh, this is going to be very, very different from, uh, from, from the talks that we have heard uh, in this conference so far. Um, so I thought I should start with uh, a flock of birds because we've been seeing uh, movies of flocks of birds uh, through the conference and it seemed like a little tradition that I need to follow. So inspiration from, uh, from flocks of birds. Also inspiration from uh, various other things that we've seen, uh, and collective behavior in ants, in bacteria, in fish. Uh, so this is a movie of bacteria uh, that are moving on, an, uh, on a substrate and, and thousands of them are being tracked uh, uh, in, in this frame. Each individual color you see is a different bacterium. Um, so, so, I mean, really I don't need to say much about why collective behavior is interesting, and, and so on and so forth. And also the fact that um, there have been uh, ideas looking at you know, these aggregates as some kind of a very interesting material, and thinking about them as, uh, as fluids uh, comprised of individual units which are active. Active meaning that they're consuming energy and dissipating energy and, and uh, using that to propel themselves, uh, so to speak. Right? Uh, we've also seen um, efforts towards building uh, intelligent uh, mimics of, of these kinds of things using robots, etc., uh, and trying to get various interesting behaviors. So what I'm going to tell you uh, in the next half an hour or so is um, can we do something similar with something completely mindless, like plastic beads or oil droplets or things like this, right? Um, what kind of collective behavior can, can we start to get in systems like these without brains, without having to design many things uh, about the way int they interact with each other and so on. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about, something is wrong with this, are these kinds of experiments. What you're seeing here are two different movies comprised of the same system. You're looking at many uh, small circular things. Each of them is a little droplet of oil. Uh, and there are thousands of these droplets of oil in these movies that you're seeing. Uh, and this is, so each droplet of oil, I'll come to this in a moment, uh, is self-propelled. It's moving. And they interact with each other simply via the fluid-mediated uh, interactions. And you see very different and striking collective behavior. In one instance, all of these guys are forming these aggregate, which seems to somehow stay together. And uh, 
you change something very, very simple, just take the lid off the experiment, suddenly it, all these things start uh, demonstrating such a collective behavior, right? So this is the system I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to tell you about why these kinds of things form, why those kinds of things form, and so on. And when you look closely at each individual droplet, this is what they look like, right? So there's some, there's some structure uh, inside uh, each one of them. And I will also tell you why uh, they look like this and what it might mean for them to have this, what look, might look like a head and a tail and, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so much for the pretty movies. Uh, I hope I have your attention um, and I'll, uh, I'll delve into, uh, into the science. Uh, and luckily um, for me, uh, this work, a bulk of the work that I'm going to tell you about has just come out uh, in PNA as, yes, as of yesterday. Um, and so you can go uh, and if, if there's one thing you want to note down, maybe it's this, and you can, you can go back and read the paper and you'll get everything that I talk about. Uh, and this work was done uh, mostly at Princeton um, and some of it is, is being continued uh, in my lab now in Bangalore. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the initial motivation to create these uh, objects which do these very interesting things was to mimic uh, propulsion or motion uh, at the micro scale, okay? Um, unlike, unlike trying to build these robots which can, which can walk like, uh, let's say, wildebeest or so on, uh, what we were trying to do was um, mimic the swimming of algae or bacteria uh, and so on. So inspired by uh, how they move, um, people have over the years thought about very simple models about how to describe motion of these microorganisms without having to deal with all the complexity involved. Like they don't want to take care, you know, describe the motion of a beating flagellum and so on and so forth. So there are very simple models. Uh, I will tell you about this model very briefly um, to describe these uh, uh, small scale motions. What we have attempted to do is to create a synthetic mimic of this simple model, rather than create a simple mi mimic of this object, right? Um, and um, our aim is to, is, is to use this system not only uh, to learn about potentially new physics that comes up, uh, as I will show you in some of these systems, but also that that might lead to new insights into biology itself. And since we have created an object uh, inspired by a very simple uh, model in mind, maybe that also leads to some potentially new technology. <clears throat> okay, so the model uh, for microscale swimming that I have in mind uh, is a so-called squirmer model. This is inspired by the motion of, let's say, a paramecium. This is a microscale organism which has many, many thousands of cilia or hairs uh, on its outer surface. So how this organism swims is that each of these cilia beat um, and the beating of the cilium causes uh, perturbation in the fluid outside and it's like tiny little oars around the body and this is what propels this object, right? So um, a sort of continuum description of this kind of motion is to take simply a sphere and say on the surface of the sphere, I will prescribe a tangential slip velocity, okay? And you can write various forms of the slip velocity, and so you immerse this object which has this very special uh, uh, velocity at its interface and immerse it in a fluid um, because it pulls also the fluid ambient to it, this object itself starts moving, okay? So that's the mechanism for the propulsion of, uh, of the so-called squirmer. So what we sought to do was to create a physical mimic of the squirmer model. So we said, let's take emulsion droplets, oil droplets, and put them in a bath of aqueous solution which contains a lot of lipid, okay? A lipid or a soap molecule um, is a molecule which comprises of a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic part, right, such that all these molecules spontaneously assemble at the interface of oil and water. Okay, it's literally soap that one uses uh, at home. So one gets a 
nice monolayer of this surfactant. And if you create situations where the, where the concentration of the, of the surfactant is not uniform around the droplet, but rather there's a gradient of this concentration, one can generate spontaneously flows associated with this gradient, which corresponds exactly to that situation, and then this droplet itself will swell. So how do we actually create such a gradient? That, that becomes the question. And um, we, take, uh, we take advantage of, um, again, a very well-known phenomenon to all of us that soap in water will dissolve oil, right? Um, so what we put is oil droplets in water, and these soap molecules are in the form of these so-called micelles, and they come and dissolve this oil away and become these swollen micelles, okay? And in the process of this dissolution, what happens is that you leave behind patches of the interface which are devoid of the surfactant. And the result of having such a situation where you have some region which is covered by surfactant and some not is that the interfacial tension is different over here compared to here. And this causes a spontaneous fluid flow. And this is something that we all know and which we all will probably uh, observe in, in, a, in an hour or so from now uh, is this so-called Marangoni effect, which you've probably seen as tears of wine uh, in the wine glass, right? So this is, it's, it's exactly this effect of having a gradient of interfacial tension, which gives rise to these wine legs over here. And in this case, what it does is it gives rise to spontaneous fluid flows. So the system that we, that we um, use to generate uh, all of this motion is a special kind of oil. It's, it's, it's called 5CB. Its name is 5CB. Um, and at room temperature, it's a pneumatic liquid crystal, right? It's comprised of rod-like molecules. Um, and, uh, and these rod-like molecules uh, give an internal structure to the droplet. And this 5CB emulsion droplet that we have immersed in a bath of surfactant is gradually dissolved away, right? And what eventually happens is, if you remember the previous picture I showed you, these swollen micelles keep forming. Um, and eventually, if you, if you take a droplet, let's say that's of 250 microns in size, it gradually decreases in size so that it completely disappears. It's dissolved away. And in this whole dissolution process, I told you that you're generating gradients of this interfacial tension, which causes flows, okay? The rate at which this dissolution itself occurs can be tuned by the amount of surfactant that one adds. So you can change um, how these uh, objects shrink away and thus move. All right, so if you put one of these droplets into a bath of this surfactant and water, you observe a large scale flow inside the droplet like so. So this is a droplet which is one millimeter in diameter and you're able to view all these textures inside the droplet because of the fact that it's a pneumatic liquid crystal, okay? And what you're visualizing is the flow that's generated because of these interfacial tension gradients that, that I just told you about. So what we then do um, to create the kinds of droplets that you saw in the first movie that I showed you is to use a technology called microfluidics. So um, we break off the oil or the pneumatic liquid crystal into uniform droplets. Each droplet is about 50 microns in size. And now we can create literally millions of these, of these droplets in the matter of an hour. Right? And they're uniform and, and nice and well controlled. And if you put these droplets now into this bath of, of surfactant and water, you see that instead of seeing those large scale motions that you saw, you get these gentle motions of the individual droplets themselves. The droplets are indeed swimming uh, in, this, in this medium. Okay, and as I also told you, the amount of surfactant that you add changes the rate at which you dissolve things. And in this case, when you have these swimming droplets of this liquid crystal, the amount of surfactant you add changes the speed at which they move. 
Okay, so you have, a, you have a regime in which you can nicely control the speed of, with which these uh, droplets swim around. Do you need to do something? No. Ah. It's ironic that the slide actually said control. Okay. I think I should, yeah, I think it's okay. We just keep going, right? I think we just keep going. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip that slide in the interest of time. Oops, what's going on? Okay. Okay, so... Um, the fact that it's liquid crystalline, this droplet, and it's not a simple oil droplet, also allows us to visualize this in interesting ways, okay? Uh, so if you, have a, if you have a droplet which is comprised of this liquid crystal, I told you that there's a monolayer of surfactant at, at the interface. What this causes is the rod-like molecules of this liquid crystal sort of orient perpendicularly to the interface. And as a result, you get, an, you get all these rods oriented in such a way that you get a net uh, orientation where you have a defect right in the middle of the droplet. And if you look at this droplet uh, using polarized light, let's say polarized in this direction, through an analyzer, you see a texture inside the droplet that looks like so. Okay? And so one of these little droplets which has this symmetric director configuration inside, once it starts to swim, there's a breaking of symmetry both inside, so you see that this defect that was right at the middle sort of escapes to the end, and it's in the same direction as in which the droplet is moving. So now you know that in the previous movie that you saw, there's a head and a tail of the swimmer which comes from this director orientation inside the droplet, okay? And if you look, if you put tiny little tracer beads and follow them, so you see that this defect has moved uh, to the edge. You're following the droplet as it's moving, and you see these flows that are associated with the gradient of interfacial tension that I told you about before, right? Associated also with the flows inside is a flow outside of these, of these droplets. which we can follow by putting tracer beads on the outside. So this is the swimming swimmer droplet, which is held in place. We have a lot, many, many uh, fluorescent tracer particles on the outside, and you see that they're also dragged along by the flow, right? <clears throat> so what the swimmer does is that it generates a flow field around itself through which neighboring swimmers can interact with each other, right? So the interactions in the system are purely physical, and I will show you how those are what give rise to all the interesting phenomena that we just saw. <clears throat> so for the next few uh, experiments that I'm going to show you, the configuration is like this. We have a, two glass slides or cover slips, and sandwiched between these two is a layer of these swimmers. The direction of each of these swimmers is randomly picked because the symmetry is broken randomly, and all of these swimmers move isotropically in this, in this sort of quasi two-dimensional arena with, with the same, roughly the same speed. And if you follow the trajectory of one of these droplets, it does something like a persistent random walk, okay? But I also told you now that there are interactions because of this hydrodynamic flow fields. And what I will show you is that these flow fields can be affected by the presence of boundaries which is these walls that I just described to you as the configuration of the experiment, and how they are placed will affect what collective dynamics that we see. So I will quickly run you through a series of movies, just observations that we see, and then I will um, rationalize what's going on. So if we have a case like so, where the gap between the two cover slips is more or less the size of the swimmer itself, one notices that there's a tendency of these swimmers to form these lines or bands which travel together, which are unstable, and then uh, to some, something which looks like a splay mode. You know? So it, one, once one of them uh, starts deviating in its direction, the entire band itself breaks off. However, when we 
increase this gap slightly, something dramatic occurs, those bands no longer are unstable, but become suddenly extremely stable. Right? So you see large scale bands of these swimmers which seem to even be able to pass completely through each other and, and reform, right? And it's just this simple effect of pulling the plates slightly further apart, which has taken the situation from those unstable bands to this one. Now what we will do is take away one of the walls completely, okay? So I will present to you a situation where there's only one wall, the other wall is really far away, whether it's a solid wall, a cover slip, or a liquid air interface, okay? So this is water and air. So it's a different kind of wall. This is a different uh, flow boundary condition. In both of these situations, the isotropic or uniform distribution of these swimmers is unstable and you spontaneously get aggregation of these swimmers into these tiny little regions, okay? But then there's a very interesting difference in the nature of these aggregates depending on if the wall is solid or if it's liquid air. If the wall is solid, the aggregate looks like so, where you have a sheet of, of these swimmers. So if you look very closely, you will see that there's something which looks like a crystalline arrangement of these swimmers in the plane. And there are swimmers which are coming out of plane and being dragged back into this aggregate. So it sort of looks like a crystalline sheet where you have this vortex of swimmers which are leaving the floor and coming right back. But once you have a liquid air interface, you do form these crystalline arrangements, but then you don't do these excursions out of plane. The, the, the crystallites simply just walk around uh, in, in, they're confined to this sort of 2D plane and they're moving around and you will see that they're, they're, they're very dynamic, right? So they rearrange, break off, come back in, join together and so on and so forth. So what's going on here? Okay, so that's the snapshot of everything that I told you. In these configurations, so-called Healy-Shaw geometries, depending on the size of the gap, you either form very stable bands or unstable bands, and then when you have just these walls, you form aggregates either which excurt or go away into the third dimension or not. Okay. And now I will, I will take you back to the squirmer model. And what we've been able to do is to write a, a generic version or a general version of the squirmer model where we don't assume that this form of velocity that's in, prescribed on the sphere is symmetric in any way. It can be uh, asymmetric, it, it can have chiral components and so on and so forth. But <clears throat> what is important is that given a slip velocity that we prescribe, uh, we can actually calculate the forces and the torques that act on these objects due to these hydrodynamic interactions. Okay, I showed you that this, this kind of a thing will set up a flow field through which they interact. What we're able to do is calculate what kind of a force and a torque this object will exert on another swimmer nearby. Okay, so where do we get this slip velocity? We just measure it from experiment. So we, uh, we have a measurement of the flow field in this configuration of the Healy Shaw that I showed you. So we fit this slip velocity so that the, the flow fields uh, in, in, in our simulation slash theory match. And from that point on, we can use this slip velocity that we have fit to the measurement and change, this is, a, this is a detail of how we actually calculate the forces and torques, the so-called Green's function. So this Green's function is specific to the boundary conditions that we use. So for a given boundary condition, let's say this Healy-Shaw geometry, we are able to take that and calculate the forces and torques that result uh, on every swimmer. And using the same parameters, we can predict what will, what will happen when we have this no slip wall or this air uh, boundary, liquid, liquid, liquid boundary. To cut a long story short, um, 
our simulations, so this is the situation that we have sort of the flow field that we have fit uh, from the data, and these are all predictions of the simulation. Um, so you see that there's a very nice match between uh, experiment and these simulations. We are able to capture all the dynamics uh, over here. So what's going on? So we get a very simple qualitative picture of what's going on simply by looking at the flow field of an individual swimmer. So as I showed you in these Healy-Shaw configurations, the, the flow fields that we calculate look like this. The swimmer, in this case, is moving from uh, this direction to that. Uh, and the resultant fl flow field is like so. What you will notice is that there is a flow which sort of pulls things from the side of every swimmer, right? So these pulling uh, forces naturally have the tendency to create these lines, right? And that's what you're seeing resulting in both these configurations that lines spontaneously form simply because uh, each swimmer is entrained in the flow field of the other. Likewise, when you have simply this one wall, what you notice is that when there's, when there's a solid wall, there's this recirculating flow in the third dimension and uh, a flow like so uh, here. And if you look in plane, this looks like a monopolar field. So you have fluid being sucked in from all directions and consequently what you have is swimmers coming in from all directions giving rise to a two-dimensional aggregate which is symmetric in this direction in both the cases, right? But in order to understand the subtle differences that we saw about the stability, now what, we, what I said is that we can also calculate these forces and torques that result from these hydrodynamics, right? So in, in this situation, so what we calculate are the forces that pull the swimmers together and we also calculate forces that act in the direction of the propulsion of the swimmer itself. So in this situation where we have the gap to be sufficiently small, you see that you know, there is a sufficiently strong force pulling them in, but there's also a very strong force that pushes them in the same direction. So you can imagine as a longer and longer chain forms, the force on the middle guy keeps on increasing. It's just additive. Right? So naturally, you will, you will have this sort of arrowhead configuration where the middle guy moves faster than the others, and naturally, you'll break off in this play-like mode. However, when you increase this gap, the force that pulls in these swimmers together increases significantly, whereas the force that sort of pushes them along their propulsion direction reduces significantly. So you can immediately see that once these bands form, they're very, very stable, right? And if you look at a, if you look at a sort of phase diagram which depends on, on the speed of these uh, particles, there are these stable and metastable or unstable lines in both these configurations. You just shift these phase boundaries because all you have changed really is, is this gap. You don't change anything qualitative, you only change something quantitative. <clears throat> Whereas over here, a, a very similar picture plays out. When you have this solid wall, the forces that pull, in, pull them in are very strong, as are the forces that push them out. As a result, these swimmers get pushed out of the wall and you get this recirculating motion. And in this configuration, you, the forces that push the swimmers out of plane are extremely small. And as a result, you get these crystalline crystallites which are just uh, confined to the plane. What's very interesting here, however, is that there's a qualitative difference because of the qualitative difference in the boundary condition of the flow field. Here, the flow field closes on itself. There's a recirculating flow, which is what causes these excursions and coming back. Whereas in this kind of a situation, the flow never closes on itself. As a result, you only get either these 2D crystals or crystals which are unstable, whereas here you get this very interesting vortex stabilized crystal as we, as we call it, okay? And now, very, very quickly, what I, in the last five minutes, what I will do is to say that if we think about this from the viewpoint of uh, statistical mechanics, this is really a, a, a phase separation or a, a phase transition that, that we are actually seeing over here, right? And this phase separation 
is induced by the flow fields that are set up by these swimmers. Okay? In the absence of any boundaries, in the absence of any boundaries, hydrodynamic interactions are typically destabilizing. They don't give rise to the spontaneous aggregation of, of swimmers. Where, but in the presence of boundaries, this picture changes. Right? So the phase separation here that we see is driven by these dissipative flows rather than uh, something that we can derive from a potential. And the kinetic roots that, that lead to the formation of these aggregates depends on the boundary condition. Right? So if you have a wall, you get these aggregates which are very dynamic and keep mixing up. Whereas if you have this liquid air interface, you get crystallites which are extremely stable. They don't mix up and so on and so forth. Okay, And this flow induced phase separation is, I must point out two very interesting features of this. Um, the self propulsion of the object itself is not necessary to cause this. Okay? It's sufficient that the particles produce simply a long range external flow field. So even when the, the propulsion is set identically to zero, we still see the fact that you get these metastable lines and stable lines in our phase diagram. And in the absence of any noise in this system, any positive value of activity, however small, spontaneously leads to a phase separation. So a uniform state is unstable to this um, aggregation, and you will very quickly go to this crystalline arrangement, no matter what the configuration, as long as you have a very small activity. Very, very, very quickly, <clears throat> I want to point out to you that this flow-induced phase separation that we have uncovered over here should be seen complementary to another mechanism um, of phase separation in these active systems, so-called motility-induced phase separation. Very quickly, the argument over there is that if you have self-propelled particles, irrespective of how they move, whether they're, and, and these particles are not uh, immersed in an ambient fluid, they're just, you can think of them really as uh, wildebeest moving. They, the, the phenomenology is that they accumulate where they move slowly, and the particle speed itself depends on the local density of the particles, right? So it's low where the density is high. So this sort of gives rise to a feedback mechanism giving rise to aggregation spontaneously. So, like I said, the motility-induced phase separation, which I just mentioned, is kinematic in origin. It only depends on this, how the speed of this particle uh, changes, right? And, the, and then you have these density-dependent currents, which are due to the collective effects of the particles, which lead to aggregation. In the, however, this, this situation that we have just uncovered, we know very nicely the dynamics that lead to this, this whole uh, process itself, right? So it's, it's dynamical in origin, not kinematic. And I've also told you that the, the constituents just need to be active, not necessarily motile. And this whole mechanism is very sensitive to the boundary conditions that, that we impose. And as a result, you can tune the structures you get by just placing this whole aggregates in different boundary conditions. Okay? So there are other similar aggregation scenarios in other active matter systems, such as active colloids or swimming bacteria, which also form these crystallites, which look something like that. But we think this is a mechanism that, that um, uh, is, is flow-induced rather than a motility-induced phase separation mechanism. Okay, um, And a couple of teasers at the end. This is also a very interesting system where we can start thinking about uh, situations where you have leaders, not everyone is the same. So if you just throw in one big droplet, it behaves like a nice leader. So you see that this huge droplet is sort of carrying a pack of tiny little swimmer droplets behind it. And what's more, we can, uh, we can put in magnetic beads into those swimmers and guide them and so on and so forth. And so you can do interesting leader-follower dynamics. And when you crank up the density, so what are all the things that I've shown you is when density is quite low, crank up density, there are other interesting effects which come into play because of the dissolution and the chemical effects. And um, 
you start to see various kinds of interesting pattern formation like dynamics uh, in, this, in this system. And with that as a teaser, I'll thank you very much for your attention.